Thanks very much, Alan. Um, it's a privilege to be here. It's wonderful to be here. So I'm Molly, I'm a library assistant. Um, and I'm just going to introduce Dr. Orla Murphy. So Dr. Orla Murphy is the head of the Department of Digital Humanities in University College Cork, Ireland. Her research explores the integration of emerging digital um, technologies with the humanities and scholarship and pedagogy. So it's wonderful to welcome Orla and I look forward to um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. Everyone. Hi everyone, I'm hopefully I'm you can hear me. Yeah, you can hear you and we can see yeah. you. Although now you're gone on mute. Yeah, I think I'm back there now. <laughs> right. Um, well, thank you so much um, for the invitation to speak with you today on one of my favourite topics, uh, which is VR in um, teaching and education. And I, it prompted me to have a look back at how long I've been at this. And unfortunately, I had to say that I've been around for 20 years. And some things have changed, but some things have stayed the same. And I'm going to chart some of that and perhaps talk a little bit about potential at the end of uh, this discussion today. So I'm going to go right back because we're in the fourth information age. I'm going to go back to the first information age and speak um, to one of the problems that we, uh, I think, continually face when we look at VR and when we look at new technology in general, in that there is sometimes resistance to change. And there's a kind of an urgent querying of what it is that we're about in the first place. So here we have Socrates, who is being taught writing a very new technology in uh, 370 CE. And he writes that writing is inferior to speech. It's like a picture. It can't give any answer to a question. It, it has only a deceitful likeness of a living creature. It has no power of adaptation, but uses the same words for all. It is not a legitimate son of knowledge. So in other words, Plato is writing about Socrates' reticence with the new technology. Um, and very, very like today, we have issues arising whereby there's a reticence to embrace new technology because perhaps unlike traditional methods, it's perceived as not a traditional son of knowledge. But happily for us, the new technology of writing caught on and Plato's description of Socrates um, has persisted. So beginning with VR then in research um, way back in 2002, um, there was an urgent consideration being a PhD researcher on the nature of representation, of remediation, of knowledge modeling and knowledge work as part and parcel of the PhD. And way back in the day, we were looking, you know, we were coding by hand kind of in VRML, you know, texturing mesh models, using secondhand equipment and having to hand build machines to handle the file sizes because your standard CPU wouldn't manage it. Right. All of the images I'm going to use today um, will be are in my uh, my thesis, which is openly available on Cora. And straight away um, we met with some interesting hurdles because, believe it or not, in submitting the thesis to the library back in the day, there was no um, way of handling out of the arts faculty faculty a CD. And we ended up looking at perhaps putting things on tape. Right. So the infrastructure to support this for me has always been rooted in the library as a neutral space whereby this kind of knowledge work can be held and maintained and represented in an open way um, for for uh, for future generations and for future research and work. One of the problems that we encountered immediately at the time, of course, was that we had used proprietary software, so the models themselves weren't available. So there is a significant cultural adjustment required, if you like, a meta level analysis of the nature and quality of VR in a way that if you're doing research or if you're teaching in a classroom, you know, just standing up and speaking traditional didactic method, that's not going to be questioned. Similarly, if you're doing kind of research, you know, with 80,000 words for a PhD written on A4, that's not going to be um, questioned. However, bringing in aspects, you know, that challenge people's reception of traditional modes like dimensionality um, really uh, question and push out the boundaries in terms of teaching. 
So <clears throat> we were always asked why the unspoken question being, you know, all this time and effort and expense and to what end? So here is a nice little example here um, um, of uh, of the uh, of the ends. So what we're able to do there is we're able to collapse the boundaries of space and time. We're able to bring people to um, this model, right, and zoom in on it. Um, at the time, it was in a crumbling wall in the back of um, a cathedral in Lismore. And we were able to bring in an international lens, an international um, scholarship to look at this because through the affordances of the digital, we were able to create a model that others could interact with, no matter where they were at what time of the day. Uh, so this is a real demonstration of access and democratization of access through um, digital teaching and learning. Um, <clears throat> I, I ended up um, later working with a number of colleagues all across Europe on a number of technologies, instruments, data types, um, looking at different ways of bringing this type of work out into the world. Um, because we also met the, um, the challenge that we weren't doing the work anymore if we were working in um, VR or in 3D, but that the machine was doing the work. And of course, we know that there's so many options and so many choices to be made um, within a particular knowledge model in order to create a given result that that isn't the case. Um, <clears throat> so um, there's a significant cultural adjustment required, you know, when we look at pedagogy as well as when we look at research. Um, and I give you this really nice quote from uh, David Harvey, who suggests that the only way to eliminate the fascism in our heads, which is, you know, traditionalism and only thinking of things, you know, in a particular way, um, which is, he says, is to explore and build upon the open qualities of human discourse and thereby intervene in the way that knowledge is produced and constituted at the particular sites where a localised power discourse prevails. Um, so what he means there is for us actually to be bold and be brave and, you know, to kind of move beyond what um, the localised power discourse is and to, you know, not just with their research, but in this case with research led pedagogy to push out what's received in terms of teaching and learning. So I'm going to skip forward almost 20 years then to the latest research that I've um, undertaken. Right, um, where we've created, um, uh, this is through the work with a student, um, a PhD student called Larkin Cunningham. And initially we tried looking at Second Life and Open Sim as a way of, you know, leveling identities, you know, through av avatars, you know, um, ethnicities, genders, all of those things, if you like, um, allied and aren't important um, in terms of setting up avatars, you know, absolutely, you know, increasing accessibility that nobody had to go to a particular site at a particular time, you know, if they had other responsibilities. And of course, to bring in play, um, to bring in the concept of serious games, to bring in this whole idea of edutainment. And to really, I suppose, examine immersive environments for, le for learning and um, to look at the ways in which, which, for instance, lock of muscle memory, the shift from the digital to the real um, helps us to have uh, an understanding of the world in an immersive environment, how we can, for instance, in an in an immersive environment, understand space and size versus you know, traditional um, screens that flatten, um, for instance, I don't know, the Eiffel Tower on a screen that could be two inches high, you know. But um, what we wanted to examine in the research was how can we know what people have learned in these immersive environments? And again, this is in Cora, and the research was an adaptive model for digital game based learning. And what we discovered was that in the immersive environment, every learner had a personal learning journey, that each student traversed the game and the game environment, which was achieved in Unity 3D um, differently, and they achieved their tasks individually. And most important, we were able to, through the use of a dashboard and with learning analytics, to track those um, in a meaningful way, make changes to the game and make suggestions individually to the learner in order that they could adopt their learning, right? And um, so very much moving from MDA um, in terms of games from mechanics, dynamics and aesthetics to a solo taxonomy for learning, which is a structure of observed learning outcomes, um, big 
Biggs's method and via Vygotsky. And Vygotsky as a principle, you know, when he's defining this zone of proximal development, um, he speaks of the distance between the actual developmental level as determined by independent problem solving and the level of potential development as determined through problem solving under guidance or collaboration with more capable peers. So in other words, um, you can really within a game environment, within a virtual world, scaffold the learning for learners. And with a good dashboard and with, uh, with I suppose, a good framework in place, you can really work towards um, a really observable learning outcome so that we're no longer kind of speaking in um, anecdotal or abstract terms, but that we can actually visualize very clearly not alone how people learn, but how they learn as individuals and the progress of their learning um, through a given world. So, um, this idea then, you know, I think is really valuable in that we still have challenges, you know, that we have to answer with regards to, you know, the internet, these, you know, virtual worlds, which is, which is all gaming really, you know, and how, you know, to convince peers, but the research is increasingly out there with regards to um, the achievement of pedagogical potential and specifically the scaffolded um, mapping of learning journeys the use of analytics and the iterative adjustment um, towards the end. So yes, challenges, yes, opportunities. Some of the same challenges persist as regards um, perhaps cost and perhaps a learning curve um, with regards to not just uh, students, but also peers. But significantly, I think the potential is huge and that we can prove and have proven the potential for uh, learners in virtual environments. And I look forward to hearing the work of colleagues and seeing how that um, how that work is being uh, further advanced elsewhere. So, um, yeah, infrastructural issues persist. Um, I think it's incumbent on us all to uh, support our libraries as a place where we can have uh, a lot of this uh, equipment and expertise centrally so that individual departments or researchers or pedagogues aren't um, you know, responsible for maintaining it and updating it and holding on to it, but that we also need to have a radical openness as well. right? In other words, that if I create something that's really useful, that I might openly share it, but we need an infrastructure to support that. Um, and uh, just, I suppose we can't speak today without speaking about meta, and that will be a significant challenge, but that I think we do need to hold on to a space for pedagogy, for teaching and learning, and that, uh, again, this radical openness where we can all share what it is that we're making um, and share our learning with each other will be really important in this regard. So there are some of the references there. Um, Ramila Mahagwev, that's my uh, email, my Twitter handle, and I'm very happy to chat. Thank you for listening to me today. Thank you so much, Orla.